Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And through you, Madam Speaker, I have a few questions for the proponent of the bill as amended. You may proceed, Madam. Thank you. Uh, I understand from the description of the bill that the qualifications to be entered into this institutional financial aid were drawn from the Federal Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program. Is that correct? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Haddad. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, yes, I would say that those were the inspiration for the qualifications that are listed. They are not identical to those qualifications um, for, uh, uh, for a number of reasons, um, uh, but uh, they, are, they were inspired by those same qualifications that have been set aside, uh, established for the, for the DACA program. Representative Cheeseman. Thank you. I realize this is a Senate amendment and the uh, good proponent of the bill may not have an explanation, but I would wonder why changes were made in those uh, requirements that relate to the federal program. For instance, the change of from the age of 31 to 30 through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Haddad. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, I think that that in particular change um, is just a convention of uh, the way that the uh, federal uh, 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 information was drafted and the way our state uh, legislation is drafted. I think that they are um, the same, in fact, requirements, uh, but, but worded slightly differently. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Cheeseman. Thank you. Well, I'm looking at the 15-page document from the United States uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services on the requirements for requesting DACA, and it does state if you were under the age of 31 as of June 15, 2012, and I return to my question, is, is this good proponent of the bill aware of uh, why that uh, change was made? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Haddad. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, again, I think that there's no substantive change between um, DACA and the amendment on that particular moment point. Um, the, the, the fact sheet that I had that was offered uh, to us from the Office of Legislative Research uh, lists that the qualification for DACA is uh, that they meet the criteria that they were younger than the age of 31 as of June 15, 2012. Um, and the convention and the way that they drafted it um, to be exactly the same is that they were 30 years of age or younger on uh, June 15th, okay. 2003. So, that, so younger than 31 was translated to be 30 years of age or younger. I think that means the same thing, um, but it's a, con it's a drafting convention uh, difference between uh, the way they worded the criteria at the federal government and the way our legislative commissioner's office words uh, that criteria um, in Connecticut. Representative Cheeseman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, that does make sense. And I have another question. I see that uh, these students will not be eligible if they were convicted of a felony. Again, looking at the UCSIS documentation for DACA, they also exclude uh, people who have committed a significant misdemeanor, three or more other misdemeanors, and do not otherwise pose a threat to national security or public safety. And through you, Madam Speaker, I wondered why that significant misdemeanor was removed, because among our Class A misdemeanors are vehicular homicide, assault on an elderly blind person. There are a number of very serious crimes that I would have thought because the federal government certainly sees them as a red flag, would have been included among those disqualifying uh, uh, convictions. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Haddon. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, this was a compromise. Um, uh, uh, again, there were a uh, number of us sitting around the table. Um, the, um, the starting point was uh, to include all of the criteria that were um, laid out um, as a, it was an offer made by one of my Republican colleagues. Um, in the discussion, we agreed um, at that day at that table uh, that while well, we, uh, we thought that it was reasonable um, to uh, prohibit uh, the, those who have been convicted of a felony, um, we wanted to, you know, some of us wanted to uh, ensure uh, that um, second chance opportunities were afforded as we do with our regular student body. 
um, uh, to, uh, no, to, they're, they're to, to folks, uh, including this population. And so while this was one of those areas where there was certainly a proposal that was made, um, there, there was give and take by both sides. Um, our side accepted the idea that we would be uh, uh, prohibiting uh, those who were convicted of a felony, um, and those who were, made the proposal initially um, conceded uh, the misdemeanors uh, and the threat of uh, to national security. Uh, mo more on that second item, just because it, was, it would be difficult to, for a college to assess whether or not one was a threat to national security. Um, and, and, uh, and so, uh, and so the, the compromise was struck. Um, I think it was a fair um, compromise, one that gave uh, both sides a little of what they were asking for, but neither side got all that they were asking for. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Cheeseman. Thank you for that explanation. I consider, uh, continue to be troubled because I do think those, the misdemeanors cited are in fact serious. Um, with regard to, again, um, the colleges and universities determining whether or not these young people have been in compliance with the requirements that we've laid out, um, it, it, will this be up to them to determine how to do it? Because again, with the federal guidelines, there's quite an extensive series of documents that need to be presented at each stage to determine whether or not you are in fact in compliance. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Haddad. Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, I would say that uh, one thing I would say is that um, it, it appears as though everybody who is included in the DACA program um, is also eligible uh, to, meet, to meet all of the criteria that we've laid out in this section. And so the easiest way for a student um, who is enrolled in the DACA program to demonstrate compliance with these uh, criteria is to present um, a, a, a documentation of their DACA status to the university. And that, I think, is the overwhelming majority of the people um, that we're referring to here. Um, for those um, who are not currently enrolled in DACA, and there are a couple of reasons why that would be, um, uh, some being, in fact, that they are too young to be uh, uh, to have been qualified for DACA, um, they would have to provide to the university um, adequate information um, that would demonstrate compliance with these criteria. Our expectation, uh, again, is that while this population is very small and the number of students in this category is even smaller, um, that that would be something that could be reasonably accommodated uh, by the university. Um, and um, uh, and that, I, that I think is what the practical effect of of these, these uh, criteria would be. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Cheeseman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I do agree with the proponent of the bill that the easiest way for young people to demonstrate that they are in compliance with these requirements would, would be to present their DACA documentation and they all would have been issued with an employment authorization document. But it is estimated according to Citizens uh, Center for Immigration studies that there are approximately 11,000 Connecticut uh, residents who would have been eligible for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. And in, a, in, actu in actual fact, there are only 3,700 who completed the DACA process. Madam Speaker, the clerk has an, has, has an amendment. It is LCO number 4169. I, would you please ask the clerk to call it and I'd be allowed to summarize. Will the, clerk, will the clerk please call LCO number 4169. Designated. Designated as House Amendment A. House Amendment Schedule A, LCO number 4169, offered by Representative Cheeseman, Representative Cummings, Representative Wilms. Representative Cheeseman. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. The purpose of this bill would be to, in effect, enshrine what I understood was the agreement among the proponents of the bill, that it would make formal the necessity of young people who were applying for this program to adhere to the uh, specifications and uh, qualifications of the Federal Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, both in terms of qualifying, having no misdemeanor convictions, and presenting all the documentation as outlined by the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services Department to prove their eligibility for this program. And with that, Madam Speaker, I move adoption of the amendment, and I ask that when the vote is taken, it be taken by roll. Question before the chamber is on a roll call. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. The requisite 20% has been met. When the vote is taken, it will be taken by roll. The question is also on adoption of House Amendment Schedule A. Will you remark further on the amendment Schedule A? Representative Cheeseman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, as I said before, I believe the understanding, and I, I will say, had this been presented as a bill open to recipients of the DACA uh, program or those who were eligible, I think it would have been easier for me to be in favor. We talked about intent before. Anyone who applied to the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival program indicated their intent to make regular their residence in the United States, to seek formal approval and recognition of their status, and to do everything in their power to be able to live and work legally in the United States. And that is to be applauded. Whatever, however one feels about the program, when it was instituted by executive order, but it exists, and 3,700 young people in this state out of it estimated 11,000 who were eligible, took advantage of that, compiled the documentation, went through quite an onerous process. They indicated, as I said, their intent to become legal residents, legal workers in the United States. And if we are going to move this forward, I think we should be looking at those young people very valuable, very worthwhile, but they made the effort to do things the right way. And therefore, Madam Speaker, I believe this is the fairest way to move forward. It is also an easier way to ensure compliance. And I urge my colleagues to support the amendment as presented. Thank you. Representative Cummings of the 74th. Ma'am, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, on the amendment to the proponent of the amendment. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the list of um, underlying crimes in which a, per, a prospective person applying for financial aid may have been able to be convicted, is it true that an immigrant may have been convicted of criminally negligent homicide, assault in the third degree, assault on an elderly, blind, or disabled person, reckless endangerment in the first degree, larceny in the fourth degree and or a riot in the first degree and still be eligible for financial aid under this bill? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Cheeseman. Yes, that is certainly my understanding. They are listed as uh, class A misdemeanors in the state of Connecticut. Therefore, they would not be included in the bill as amended. That is why I propose my amendment to model it on the federal legislation, which includes both serious misdemeanors, three or more mis less serious misdemeanors, and being judged a threat to national or state security. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Cummings. That is all, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. We remark further on the amendment before us. Representative Cheeseman. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would just like to take this opportunity to summarize and thank everyone for their questions and input into this. I do think, as Representative Neal was kind enough to say, this amendment does fulfill the int intention behind the compromise. I do feel it fills some holes in that serious misdemeanor should be a disqualifying factor. Indeed, there are some very serious crimes in there. I know we all want to do the right thing by the citizens of our state, and therefore I urge my colleagues in this chamber uh, to vote in support of the amendment. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And through you, Mr. Speaker, I have a couple of questions to the proponent of the bill. Please proceed, ma'am. I'm referring to lines 50 through 55 that describe the uh, procedures and forms that would enable persons to apply for financial aid. Through you, Mr. Speaker, would each individual institution of higher learning devise their own form or would there be a standard form? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Haddad. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, uh, what has been asserted to us by the Board of Regents and the University of Connecticut is that this bill were to pass they would collaborate together to come up with a single um, form that could be used um, across institutions. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Cheeseman. And the purpose of this form would be one to indicate that they were otherwise ineligible to receive financial aid and to supply the uh, supporting documentation for both their uh, need and their uh, undocumented uh, eligible status through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Haddad. Uh, yes, I, I think the answer is that um, uh, the, since this population is precluded from completing the FAFSA form, um, this would provide a, uh, a mechanism to uh, make the determinations necessary to determine family and uh, need. Um, without using the FAFSA form, but instead using a state version. That is what has occurred in other states, um, uh, and uh, that is what we anticipate occurring here. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Cheeseman. And through you, Mr. Speaker, so anyone who is eligible to fill out the FAFSA form would therefore not fill out this new form. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Hadda. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, yes, I think that would probably be accurate. Representative Cheeseman. So this form would both serve to document need and uh, income status, all those elements that are in the FAFSA, but also to indicate that this individual was not, um, by virtue of their status, eligible for traditional institutional financial aid. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Haddad. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, I, you know, I guess, I mean, the form has not been developed, so I don't know what it would indicate um, and when and to which party, uh, but I think uh, that, the, that the information would certainly be collected that we're referring to um, and that, um, uh, that, uh, uh, that the financial aid officer, I, I, I would imagine, especially to comply with, with lines 56 through 60, would have some knowledge um, at some point of the financial picture and the documentation of the student, of the applicant. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Cheeseman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The clerk has in his possession an amendment. It is LCO number 4178. Would you please ask the clerk to call it and I'd be allowed to summarize? Will the clerk please call LCO 4178, which will be designated House Amendment Schedule B. B. House Amendment Schedule B, LCO number 4178, offered by Representative Cheeseman. The representative seeks leave of the chamber to summarize the amendment. Is there objections to summarization? Is there objections? Hearing none, Representative Cheeseman, you may proceed with summarization. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. One of, I suppose the main argument for the underlying bill is that our system is inherently unfair in that undocumented students are paying into a pool of money and being precluded from accessing this money. This amendment is very simple. It would in, uh, instruct our institutions of higher learning to create a procedure whereby the students would uh, attest to their undocumented status and inabil inability to access that money and therefore be exempt from paying that institutional aid percentage into their tuition. So I move adoption, and I ask when the vote is taken uh, that it be taken by roll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative. The question before the Chamber is adoption of House Amendment Schedule B. And there's been a request for a roll call vote. All in favor of a roll call vote signify by saying aye. Aye. I think the 20% has been met, so when the roll is taken, it will be taken by uh, when the vote is taken, it will be taken by roll. We remark further on the amendment. Representative Cheeseman. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, as I said, I think the underlying question with regard to the, the bill as amended is a one of fairness. And I can understand that. The fact that you're paying from between 17 and 30 percent of your tuition dollars into a fund that you have no right to access does in itself seem inherently unfair. My solution is a simple one. Simply exempt these students from paying into that pool. They would not then be paying into a, a pocket of a bucket of money to which they have no access. This suggestion had been raised earlier in higher ed. We were informed by the institutions that this was not doable. This seems to me highly unlikely. We've just outlined a procedure whereby a form can be created which would attest to their inability to access this financial aid. That in itself could be used. It seems to me a simple matter to take that 17, 22, 30 percent and simply subtract it from their tuition payment. So in the interest of fairness, I believe this is a reasonable solution, and I urge my uh, colleagues in the chamber to vote in support of this amendment. I'm sorry. Is that it? I'm sorry, ma'am. I, I, I urge my colleagues to vote in support of this amendment. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Will you remark further on the amendment before us? Will you remark further on the amendment before us, Representative Hatton? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, a question uh, through you to the proponent of the amendment. Representative Cheeseman, be prepared. Representative Haddad. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I mean, I, I, uh, two quick questions. One is, is it your understanding that um, out-of-state undocumented students would also be covered by the amendment that you are um, referring to uh, and suggested by this? And so if you were an out-of-state student and you were paying 15% of uh, out-of-state tuition rate, um, uh, that you would also uh, no longer have to pay into the eligible pool for uh, institutional aid? Representative Cheeseman. No, that would be not be my understanding. The underlying bill outlines the procedures by which we would determine the status of these individuals. So it would, no, it would not apply to out-of-state students. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Haddad. Um, I'm sorry, maybe I should clarify. I'm looking at your amendment, which says, that all public institutions of higher education shall exempt, adopt policies to exempt tuition payments made by full or part-time students enrolled in such institution who are not eligible for institutional financial aid uh, from the requirement to set aside funds for such aid. Um, and I, I guess I'm, I'm confused because currently uh, there are full-time and part-time students, I suspect, who are undocumented at, uh, at some of our institutions who are not eligible for institutional financial aid. And I'm wondering if this, um, this amendment would preclude them from being eligible, uh, uh, from being required to, to pay 15% into the institutional aid pool. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Cheeseman. Thank you. Certainly that was not my intention, although my understanding would be any undocumented students from out of state would be paying out of state tuition. So they would be paying a significantly higher a percent a higher tuition rate at any at any stage. Representative Haddad. Um, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I guess I'll just make the point that this amendment, I think, um, doesn't prevent and uh, the dreamers because it's a it's an amendment that's tacked on to the end of the section, at the end of the uh, of the the authorizing uh, section. Um, doesn't prevent the university, in fact, it would authorize um, the university to, um, uh, to offer institutional aid to undocumented students. Um, however, what it does do is it, is, it, is, it, is, it prevent, is it allows them not to be charged uh, the 15% for the institutional aid. I'm not sure it does uh, exactly what the representative um, thinks it may do, um, but I'm concerned that it would deprive uh, those students um, of the responsibility of paying into the institutional aid pool while not absolving the university of the requirement, not the requirement, but the, at least the ability to provide institutional aid to the students. Um, I would also say that there's another category of student that I think would probably be um, included in this who are ineligible for financial aid, institutional financial aid, mm -hmm. and that is uh, international students. 
Um, certainly at the University of Connecticut, while they're small in number, and the undergraduate level, at the graduate level, they're more frequent. Um, they are ineligible for financial aid, um, but they pay the full uh, uh, amount of out-of-state tuition. And so I think the net effect of this legislation, uh, this adoption of this amendment, would be uh, to significantly reduce the amount of money that go into the institutional aid without, um, without um, accomplishing the goal of, of or indicating that, they would, that these students would no longer be eligible um, to uh, collect money from the institutional aid pool. On those grounds, I, I, I would reject, uh, urge my uh, colleagues to reject the amendment. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a question for the proponent of the uh, amendment. Does this mean that any undocumented student would not be charged the 15% that they're paying now Intuition. Representative Cheeseman. The purpose of the amendment would to remove the necessity to pay the 15% in for any student who is not eligible to receive the financial aid, correct? Representative Rivero. Okay, so I must say that I like this amendment. Uh, it says that we're no longer penalizing someone and making them pay 15% into the pool and not be eligible to receive any part of that pool. This makes it fair for everyone. They will not have to pay into the pool at all. And it gives every single undocumented student a 15% scholarship. So I think it's probably one of the fairest ways there is to solve the problem that we have at the present time because I agree that nobody should pay into a fund that they cannot ex have access to. But this here clears up that situation. So I want to say that I will be in favor of this amendment and I thank you very much for bringing it forward. 